because one of the other things that I think happens as we get older is we start thinking about the value of conveying what our life experience has been like, what our family's been like, and passing that on to the next generation. But first, let's start out with, well, nothing's quite as much fun as a good murder mystery. And we've actually had quite a few of them here in Carson Valley. Yeah, we've got a, we need to touch screen it. Oh, uh, we're not forwarding. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. Ta-da! Ta so there's so much history here in Carson Valley. Um, this is Van Sickle Station. It looks a little different than it looks like today. And this is the book that my husband and I put together about the tales of Carson Valley. We hoped it would be here today. There's been a little miscommunication about that and I take full responsibility for it. It's a new book and we didn't make sure that it was here in the bookstore, but we'll be getting it for you soon. So if anybody's interested at the end of the lecture, you can give your name at the back of the room and we'll make sure you get a copy. So as I was saying, we're, um, some of the most fun stories are the murder mysteries. And we certainly have had our share of murder mysteries here in the Carson Valley. And murders, of course, are not a recent phenomenon, of course, but the investigation of murder back in the day was hardly a CSI worthy event. In fact, it was sometimes hard to even keep the suspects in custody while they were awaiting their trial. This is Genoa's old courthouse. You probably know it as the, the museum in Genoa today, but this used to be the courthouse and there was also a jail in that same building. And in fact, Genoa's jail with its very poor Mm -hmm. Okay, is that better? A little bit louder. Okay, I'll try and speak up. So Gen Genoa's jail with its poor mortar was especially known for repeatedly being break outable. And our first story is just one example of an unsolved murder story. And I'm going to let you make up your own mind about who just might have been responsible. Uh, there we go. In 1895, Anna Sarman and her husband Fritz Sarman lived out on the old Ferris Ranch, just north of Minden. Today, this is what it looks like today. You can see the big D on the hillside in the very far background. So today, it's just an open field a little bit north of Airport Road. But back in the day, the Sarman's house sat at a crossroads where the roads from Genoa, which was known as the Boyd Toll Road, cut across the valley and intersected the north-south Cradlebaugh Road. Anna and Fritz Sarman had lived here peaceably for over a dozen years. And like so many ranchers, they hailed from Germany. Their three kids were all grown and all of them live nearby. But on May 8th, 1895, well, that was a very unlucky day for Anna Sarman. You might say a bloody unlucky day. When her husband Fritz came in from the field mid-afternoon, he found Anna's body bloodied in a bedroom and the bed had been set on fire. Now, if you're gonna commit a crime, even back then, they knew you had to do something to try to conceal the evidence. Anna had been struck in the head brutally with an ax. They may not have had CSI back then, but they knew the murder weapon had been an ax because they found a bloody ax in a woodshed in the back of the home. Following the trail of blood, they decided that Anna had been killed in the living room and her body had been dragged to the bedroom where the fire was actually still raging when Fritz got home that afternoon. Fritz did manage to put the fire out before it engulfed their entire house. So that at least was good. But then Fritz went about his normal routine, his normal chores. He milked his cows before telling anyone about the murder. Now, the townsfolk in Genoa thought that was just a little strange. In fact, they thought it was so strange that rumors began to swirl that maybe Fritz had had something to do with his wife's murder. <laughs> 
Fritz Sarman, however, swore he was innocent, and he had many friends in town, many neighbors, who were confident that Fritz was not the murderer. So the search for a culprit continued. Turns out there had been a transient, and he'd been spotted in a nearby road about 3 p.m. on the day that Anna was murdered. And surprisingly enough, the local constables were actually able to find the transient. A man named Jim Williams was arrested, and Williams admitted eating breakfast at the Sarman house earlier that day. Now, back then, it was actually commonplace for ranchers' wives to feed unfortunates who were passing by on the road, and there were a couple of roads passing by the Sarman residence. So Mrs. Sarman had indeed served Jim Williams a meal, but they did some more investigating, and push came to shove, and the evidence that turned up showed that Williams could not have been the murderer. So he was released from custody and the search for a culprit continued. A second transient was arrested about two weeks later and his name was Joseph Ritchie. He was arrested at Bodie and that's a picture of Bodie in the lower right hand corner. It was a pretty rough and tumble town at the day. And sure enough, Joseph Ritchie too confessed to having been in Carson Valley the day before the murder. And his very bad luck, he wore a very narrow shoe a shoe size that actually matched prints that had been found around the outside of the Sarman home. So it sounds like Joseph Ritchie had a good chance of being the culprit, doesn't it? But no, charges against him too eventually had to be dropped for lack of evidence. There was no CSI back then. They couldn't tie fingerprints from the ax handle to collect DNA at the scene. So there was no video surveillance. The only witnesses around would have been the cows, right? and nobody ever confessed to the murder, and that murder is still unsolved today. Poor Fritz Sarman, uh oh what did we do? There we go. Poor Fritz Sarman never got to see the murderer of his wife brought to justice. That's assuming he wasn't the one, of course. He couldn't even bring himself to attend her funeral in Genoa. Now, does that sound like an innocent man? But had he been there, he would have seen a huge outpouring of grief and support in Genoa. Some 60 wagons and buggies pulled up at the Genoa Cemetery on the day that Anna was buried. And this is a photo of her grave at Genoa Cemetery. And what happened to Fritz? Well, perhaps he died of a broken heart. You'll remember that Anna was killed on May 8th. Well, Fritz died almost exactly five years later, May 12th, 1900. So was Anna killed by one of those two transients? It's possible. Was she killed by her husband? We'll never know for sure. The only witnesses were the cows and those cows, well, they weren't talking. So the murder of Anna Sarman remains a mystery to this day. Our second story is one about buried treasure and who doesn't love a buried treasure story? There are of course no sunken treasure ships near Carson Valley but that doesn't mean we haven't had our share of stories. Have you ever been down to Holbrook Junction? Well, there's another spot just before you get there on the east side of Highway 395, which has actually a historic marker there. It's really easy to drive by without even realizing it, but stop the next time you go through. It's kind of fun to read it. It identifies this as the site of Double Springs. And after this next story, you just might wanna pay a visit. Now, Double Springs was an extremely important site for decades, for generations, for the Washoe tribe. Families from all over the valley would gather here every fall for the annual pine nut gathering and harvest, and they'd have a big celebration. This photo shows Washoe natives with baskets for cooking the pine nuts and a big gathering basket just showing in the corner in the right. For one thing, of course, there were abundant pine nut trees close by. And as the name Double Springs implies, there were also two springs which provided water. So it was a good spot to get everyone together. And as many as 500 Native Americans would gather there every fall. Well, in the early days of Carson Valley, mining began to go on in the pine nut area as well. The Aurora Bodie Road went through there too, heading south, and a stage station soon opened at Double Springs. And the stage station at Double Springs was basically that red rectangle sort of toward the right and a little bit toward the top. 
stages, of course, were a regular form of transportation. They operated on a regular schedule and a predictable schedule, much like taking the bus would be today. And that also made them exceedingly convenient for local stage robberies. The stage robbers soon figured out that stages made a very easy target. There might be a shipment of gold or other valuables aboard, and even if not, there would be passengers with gold watches and deep pockets to rob. So segue now along to 1863. The Comstock mines were bustling. Aurora was in full swing to the south. Here's an image of Aurora, and you can see how close Bodie is located to it. This is the town of Aurora and one of the mining company's stocks. You can see the stage road coming into Aurora and winding its way north in the pink. So picture a stagecoach jostling its way along the dirt road near the station at Double Springs, which would have been off the map at the top. And out of the sagebrush stepped an armed highwayman. He was alone, but he had a gun. And maybe it was an inside job, or maybe he simply got exceptionally lucky that day. In any event, the robber hit payday. That particular stagecoach was carrying $17,000 in gold coin. $17,000 back in 1863. Now that would be worth close to $350,000 today. That's a lot of loot. But then think about just how heavy $17,000 in gold coins was gonna be. Even riding a horse, a single robber wasn't gonna get very far carrying that kind of a load. But like all good criminals, this robber thought ahead. He brought a shovel. And somewhere in the flats, not far from Double Springs, he dug a hole and he buried his loot. So what happened to the robber? Well, according to legend, he finally was apprehended for some crime or other, and he spent his final days in Nevada State Prison. As he was getting close to death, the robber knew he couldn't take all that gold with him to the next life. So on his deathbed, he finally described the exact spot where he buried that treasure. He said it was south of Double Springs, and it was roughly a mile and a half north of another old way station known as Mountain House, which is right near Holbrook Junction today, and it was near a small cabin. Now that was a pretty, pretty good description, but not quite detailed enough. And over the years, many a Carson Valley lad tried their best to locate that buried treasure. A local named George Dale was said to have dug up a good sized ranch in a vain search for the treasure. Another local named Charlie Holbrook, obviously related to the Holbrook Junction family, he tried his hand using a divining rod and boy was he determined. When his divining rod told Charlie he had found the right spot, he kept digging and digging and digging. And at least according to the local newspaper, he went as much as 28 feet deep before he finally threw in his shout hole. A Genoa resident named Henry Rice had a dream in 1891 that revealed to him the exact spot where the treasure was gonna be found. And he was so excited, he rounded up a male friend and several young ladies, and they hightailed it from Genoa by wagon down to Double Springs where their hopes were dashed. Sadly, they found a hundred places that had looked just exactly like the site that had been revealed in Henry's dream. But they did manage to get a nice picnic lunch out of the excursion. <laughs> and if you think about it, all that disappointment is actually a good thing in the end, right? Because if you believe the old legend, that lost stagecoach treasure is still out there somewhere, just waiting to be found. Our third story is about what I call the ugly duckling of Gardnerville. And this is one of the buildings that if you've driven through Gardnerville, you've probably seen. And we got really interested, like, what is this building? It just feels like it has a story to it. And turns out it does. This is right at the S Benz in Gardnerville, the opposite side of the road from Sharkey's. It's really in sad need of fresh paint and half of the siding on the front is peeled off revealing the old boards underneath. And somebody actually ran into it with a car a couple of years ago, but we were curious. It looked like this building had pride or something. There was just something that caught our attention. So we started asking around 
And old timers told us it used to be a laundry in the 1940s and 50s, well up into the 70s. But what was it before that? Well, with a little bit of digging and thanks to the great records of the Historical Society in Gardnerville, we found out that humble rundown building actually used to be a school. And at one time it was the pride of East Fork. It was actually built for the East Fork School District in 1880. And it didn't originally sit there at the Espens where it is today. It actually was three miles to the south, just north of where the smoke shop is today on the east side of the river. Here's an 1876 newspaper notice having to do with the prior original school, which they had moved and then changed, the, changed their minds and decided in 1880 that they needed to build a new school. And they built the one that's now at the S Bend. The students who attended there read like a who's who of early Carson Valley. There were kids from the Hoosman family and many more big names the Jacobsons, the Rodenbaas, Dangbergs, Burning, Settlemeyer, Springmeyer, and Sill. Here, the teacher in this picture is supposed to be the one at the back right, but I'm guessing it's actually the seated lady in the middle. And the girls are from the Hoosman, Jacobson, Rodenbaugh, and Dangberg families. Well, the local East Fork ranchers aspired to make their East Fork school the best one of the valley outside of Genoa. They couldn't beat Genoa. They knew they couldn't beat that, but they wanted the best they could provide for their kids. New desks were purchased in 1882 and a fine chapel organ was added in 1884. And they had a great school bell added to the building too. This schoolhouse functioned as more than just a school. It served as a gathering place for the whole community. They had Sunday church services there. When voting time rolled around, that's where you would go to cast your vote. One of the stories that I loved was that the teachers would put together programs featuring the kids and selling tickets to the parents at 50 cents a head. And that money was used to buy books for the school library. My favorite story about those events is that the teachers really knew how to please the German parents. They made sure that some of the songs that the kids sang were sung in German. There was no dithering with fancy concepts like the separation of church and state. Christmas celebrations for the whole community would happen inside that school building. But they did separate the boys from the girls. The schoolhouse originally had two doors in the front, one door for boys, one door for girls. And if you look carefully at this old building at the S Bend, you can still see where those old doors used to be. They've been made into windows today, one on each side of today's front door. Some 20 to 40 kids attended school each semester at the original East Fork School and many kids would pass through its doors over its 35 year lifespan. But by 1915, school districts were combining for efficiency sake, and we were beginning to get cars after all. And as Minden became settled, more children were living closer to town. So the East Fork Schoolhouse outlived its usefulness as a school, but it was a sturdy wooden building and that couldn't be let go to waste. Henry Elges bought the building and had it moved to its present location at the S Bend in Gardnerville. And he opened a greengrocer's store there. The Ellis family later had a grocery store in it as well. By the 1930s, the building had turned into a Chinese laundry and it was acquired in August, 1940 by the Nishikita family. Now, some of you may remember Joe and Mitzi Nishikita who operated the laundry there after Joe got back from serving in World War II. Joe had joined the US Army and was stationed in Germany and that's where he met his wife, Mitzi. Joe had an interesting story actually of his own. Joe was uh, Japanese American. Uh, he tried to enlist several times during World War II before the army would take him. And that's a story in itself. Back then they were leery of taking the Japanese into the army. He had to apply three times before they took him in 1943. All told, the Nishikita family had the laundry for over 25 years, and it's still owned today by Nishikita family descendants. The building is in pretty sad shape right now, especially after getting struck by the car. And there's talk about demolishing it entirely, and that would make me sad. Um, after all, at one point, it really was the pride of Eastport. Our fourth story is another ugly duckling building story. You may have seen this building right in downtown Gardnerville. It's roughly opposite Sharkey's, but it's so nondescript. I know I drove by it 
hundreds of times before I ever paid any attention to it. And yet there's a plaque on the side, a historic plaque. This was the Gardnerville Branch Jail. It was a satellite jail for a time when Genoa was the official county seat. It was designed with fold down metal frames for the beds, they called them Murphy beds. So the prisoners could fold down the bed and sleep in it. Upstairs was the judges quarters. And believe it or not, for prisoners, this was a big improvement over what the where the deputies used to put them. The judge, L.S. Ezel, well, he looks like kind of a no-nonsense guy, right? He had been the justice court judge at East Fork since 1894. I'm sorry, 1884. And he owned a granary building on his property. You know, granary building would be where you stored grain and it would be dusty and dirty and have rodents in it. He kindly allowed the constables to look, lock up offenders there in his granary building if they didn't want to bother hauling them all the way to Genoa to the jail there. So imagine being a prisoner with all the dust and dirt. It was described by the local newspaper as a vile hole, no fit place for a human being. But this guy was the judge. Nothing changed until 1909 when after 25 years on the bench, Judge Ezel retired. And he kindly donated his granary property to the county in case they wanted to keep using it as a holding cell. Well, the county commissioners finally approved building a new concrete jail here in 1910. They paid Louis Springmeyer $25 to draw up the plans. Pretty fancy, right? It started out being just designed to be just one story tall, but you know how county government works. The size pretty soon doubled and the cost likely doubled too. And by the way, now they needed a salary for a jailer, which turned out to be $2 a day or $4 a day when he had to run the chain gang. This was only gonna be a branch jail though, with the main jail still being in, Gardner, in Genoa. And then on June 28th, 1910, much of Genoa burned down in a fire. The story goes that at the jail in Genoa, they already had one prisoner in custody. They took him out and they chained him to a post before they could move him to the new still under construction Gardnerville branch jail. So eventually the county seat was moved to Minden and that's the new Minden courthouse at the very center and the far back. And it had jail cells in the basement when it was first built in 1916. So the branch jail was supposed to be discontinued but for some reason it wasn't. For reasons of economy, convenience, habit, or lingering tensions between the towns of Gardnerville and Minden, the old branch jail actually continued to be used to house prisoners well into the 1950s. And today, believe it or not, this building is on the National Register of Historic Places. The documentation describes it diplomatically as an excellent example of turn of the century architecture <laughs> with steel cages large hasps and padlocks, a wood stove for heat, and those great fold down beds. So the moral of the story, sometimes there's great history buried beneath the worst of the ugly ducklings. I want to tell you this story to carry with you to appreciate even the ugly ducklings that are still historic for us because they may not be around forever. Our fifth story is another murder story. And interestingly enough, it goes back to that same place we talked about earlier, Double Springs, the same place as the original treasure story. Again, there's not much left today to mark the site of the original 1860s Double Springs station, except that historic plaque behind, beside Highway 395. But as we've seen, there used to be an early hotel and stage stop here, which served the Aurora and Bodie trade. The station was acquired by a man named James Dean in 1863. And we think this is a photo of James Dean himself who would have been the station keeper. Now Dean himself was a colorful, if a slightly shady character. He'd held several offices in the territorial government of Nevada before briefly serving as a justice of the peace for Genoa. And he also served in the House of Representatives in the territorial legislature in 1863. 
In late 1863, he moved here to Double Springs, where he was operating a, quote, first-class hotel with his wife, Fanny. And one day in 1864, a teamster stopped by at the Double Springs station and discovered Fanny's lifeless body. She'd been severely beaten. Her head had been jammed into a bucket of water. Now her husband, the justice of the peace, James Dean was arrested, but he proclaimed his innocence. As he pointed out, this was a spot where travelers came and went. It could have been anyone, could have been anyone on the road. The neighbors, however, were not satisfied with the story he told. But here again, there was no evidence of Dean's involvement and they were forced to let him go. Not surprisingly, he sold the station the following year, 1865, to a rancher named P.L. Sprague, and he went on and moved down to the Walker River precinct just to the south, and somehow or other, he managed to get himself elected a justice of the peace there. His next few years were somewhat rocky. Dean married again a second time in 1869, but he wasn't cut out for marriage, it seems, and his second wife divorced him in 1872. There's a bunch more to his story, but the bottom line is he died in 1910 in Michigan from what on his death certificate was listed as cancer of the head and general senility, which really meant old age. He would have been about 80 years old at the time. But one thing struck me on the death certificate, it describes a cancer of the head, which is sort of an odd cause of death. It was never proven, of course, that James Dean was the one who had shoved Fanny's head in a bucket of water and killed her. But if he did, it seems like fate or karma caught up with James Dean. Our sixth and last story is about a little house on Mono Avenue. Does this look familiar? If you've been to uh, Minden, it probably does. A lot of the houses look kind of similar, but this is a uh, one that still stands there today. It's right across the street from the old brick Minden Elementary School. And you can barely read the sign over the door. It says justice. And justice was indeed dispensed here at one time. The local judge, Walt Fisher, and his wife, Alice, and kids lived here. Now, Fisher was elected Justice of the Peace for East Fork Township in 1954, taking office in January 55. And it was actually a second career for him. He'd worked previously for the V&T Railroad for over 40 years, including serving as a station master at Minden. One of his very first judicial acts when he was elected involved a fellow whose face is probably very familiar to you, Clark Gable. And as you probably know, Clark Gable was very fond of Carson Valley. There's a great photo of him and another wife, I think it's Carol Lombard, inside Sharky's Casino. In 1955, however, Gable came here to be married to an actress named Kay Williams. It was her third marriage and Gable's fifth. And they didn't want any advanced publicity. Now, Judge Fisher had no idea that a marriage was even being planned. Gable and his intended just showed up late in the day and asked to apply for a marriage license. The county clerk called Fisher's house and asked if a couple could come over to his house and be married. Well, of course, he said, fine, send them over. The clerk didn't bother to mention who she was sending over. So you can imagine Judge Fisher's surprise when he opened the front door. And as luck would have it, the couple had brought their own witnesses with them. Now that didn't always happen. Often Judge Fisher's wife um, would serve as step as, in as a witness if the people showed up and wanted to be married and hadn't brought their own witnesses. But in Gable's case, uh, they brought their own witnesses with them. So it wasn't necessary for Mrs. Fisher to serve as a witness. And she didn't even know who had been at her home until several minutes after the wedding was over and they had left. It is said that the judge paid dearly later for not letting her know. <laughs> but my happiest story about Judge Fisher involves his stint, not as a judge, but as a priest. Not a real priest, mind you. But here's how it happened. One morning, very early in the morning, a female driver was backing her car away from a bar very drunk and hit a parked car. Police officers responded and they determined that the lady was very drunk, very, very drunk. Now, today, if that happened, they would just haul you off to jail and 
keep you there. If they needed a warrant, they'd call the judge on the phone. Back then, they just took her to the judge at his house. So they took her to the steps of Judge Fisher's house at 4.30 in the morning. And the judge, of course, had been fast asleep. So when officers knocked on his door, he answered the door in his black bathrobe. There stood the arresting officers with this very drunk woman. And she was so drunk, she was convinced that Judge Fisher was a Catholic priest. But he's not a priest, the officers insisted. He's the judge. Well, that didn't sit too well with the drunk woman either. Now she began berating Judge Fisher for impersonating a priest. <laughs> That earned her the rest of the night in jail. And in the morning, when the regular court session began, this is how drunk she was, it's that morning later, she was still too tipsy to face the music. In his infinite wisdom, Judge Fisher just ordered another 24 hours free lodging in the calaboose, plus a fine of $100. And that's how justice was served back in the day. Now, I talked a little bit in the beginning about the, the laundry and the Nishikita family. Um, their son, Dave Nishikita, is still a resident of Carson Valley, and he completed an oral history of his family. Here's a picture of the book that he put together with his family photos and memories that otherwise would have been tragically lost if he hadn't taken the time and trouble to do it. He included photos of his parents when they first met in Germany, um, pictures of his mom and dad standing on top of Hitler's burned out bunker in Germany. Um, the story of how his dad was actually placed in an internment camp before he was able to get out and enlisted to fight for his country. It's an important addition to the history of Carson Valley. Oh, go the wrong way. Everyone has family stories to tell, stories of their life, stories that have been handed down to them. And that's a different kind of history sharing. And so I want to encourage you to write your stories down before they become forgotten tales. Um, if you want a few books, a few tips on how to get started with a memoir, uh, the museum has been kind enough to stock our memoir book, I think, in the bookstore. I'm not sure. If not, I can get them. <laughs> um, because we never know how many how much time we have left to write those stories down. And of course, there are plenty more tales of murder and buried treasure, stage robberies, and more about Carson Valley's early history in the Forgotten Tales book. Um, I do a free history newsletter if any of you are interested. It's an email newsletter. There's a pink thing in the back if you want to sign up. My website has a sign up form. It's claritage.com. Uh, so just pick up one of these if you'd like to join our newsletter. And do you have any questions for me? Anybody? Yes. One of the first photos you showed us, you said there was a deed somewhere on the hillside. Is that visible in that photo? I, it should be. Let me see if I can go back to it. It's very faint. Do you know the big Douglas D on the hillside? For Douglas, I think. Yeah. There's a fence line there, and you can see a little tiny jog in the fence. That's the other way to locate where that Ferris Ranch was. There we go. One more. There we go. Okay. It's very hard to see. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. And you can't see it well in this picture, but that fence has a little jog in it. And that jog was where the house was, basically where the house was. Yes. You mentioned the shark being stuck in the house. There's a picture inside Sharky's of uh, Clark Gable. Mm -hmm. Sharkies at that time was or had just been sold to Sharkies. 
And it was called the Golden Bubble. Right. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> so you said that they had came to Sharkies. I was trying to say, maybe I misspoke, but I was trying to say there's a picture inside of Sharkies. Inside, inside there's a picture on the wall of them. But the only thing is, Sharky was there if they came and got married. No, it's just a historic picture on the wall, right inside as you go in the, in the, um, if you go into restaurant. Yeah. Yeah, they, they sold a lot of it off. Any other questions? Are there, I'm sorry, are there pictures? Yes, all those pictures are in the book. Yes. Ah, there you go. Yes. Actually, that's how this book got done. I did all the newsletter stories and um, somebody said you ought to just assemble them into a book. And so that's what I've done. And we're in the process of hopefully doing um, a book number two. We've had enough other stories. So that way, some people have actually told me they print out our newsletter stories and put them in a binder. So this way that you don't have to do that. Yes. Ferris? Ferris? Ferris. Yeah, Ferris. Right? That was Ferris, not Ferris. That was the Ferris. F E R R I S. Okay, it's not, that has nothing to do with the Ferris that didn't develop. Oh, it is. Yes, same family. It's his father. But he used to go down there, Mr. Ferris. Ferris, he went to the. So can you repeat what she said so that. Okay. So the question was whether there was a relationship between the Ferris family and the Ferris wheel. And yes, there was, it was the same family, right? And their house was in Carson Yes, they had a house in, yes. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes. The No, I don't think it's ever been a house. Yeah. Right. Right. That's a good question. Yes. Yes. So the question was about the Japanese family who lived and had the, had the laundry in um, Gardnerville. Yes, they were not relocated to an internment camp from Nevada. They had originally been over in, the, I'm trying to remember, in um, one of the farming communities over near San Francisco, I believe. And so they, they had been placed into internment camp there. And the grandmother had, the mother of the father of the guy who wrote the book, um, had been aware that there was going to be trouble coming. And she moved inland to Nevada in, on purpose, thinking there would be less trouble for the family here. And that was actually true. There was some discrimination against them here for being Japanese. The grandmother would go out on the streets and there would be um, convoys of trucks carrying people from the internment camp to work in the, like the potato fields up in Idaho and places. They were allowed to out of the internment camp to go work for farmers and ranchers. Um, but as the trucks would go by with these Japanese people in the back of the truck, the grandmother would go out with bottles of water or glasses of water to give water to the Japanese people in the trucks. And other people in town um, chastised her for that. But she was trying to do a good thing. So, but by and large, they, they did okay here. Um, they succeeded economically and their sons grew up and became very much a part of the community. When you do your research, are you using the micro um, you know, we are so fortunate here. Many of the old newspapers in Carson Valley are now digitized and available online. If anybody wants to email me, I'll give you the link. But through the Minden Library, you can sign up for access. Just all you need is a library card. And you can access all of the Douglas County newspapers and Genoa newspapers. And so a lot of it is done just sitting at home looking at old newspapers, which is wonderful. Um, but there's also a lot of resources here locally. So people are a fabulous resource. In this case, David Nishikita was a wonderful resource. Um, people who are descendants of the family. And there's somebody was talking to me earlier about Frida's files. There's a lot of other books that have been written. So yeah.
So there's, there's other documentation as well that helps, yeah. But I love the old newspapers. Some of the stories, like the story about the drunk woman who thought the judge was a priest, that came straight out of the old newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> there were stories about people on a horse going into the bar in Genoa, bringing their horse inside. Yeah, wild place. Yes. Yes, that's the story. That's the story they had the reason for it. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions about memoir writing? I really want to encourage people to write their own family stories down because you know, you think about these stories and they were like a long time ago. Well, David and Shakita's story was not that long ago. And the stories that we've lived through today and the things that our family and our oral history, our memory of our parents and our grandparents, that's gonna go away if we don't write it down. Um, so any questions about memoirs, how to get started or what to put in there, or how to do your pictures? I would really like to, if anybody has any questions, please let me know, I'm happy to help. But you also find a lot of things that I didn't know about in your ancestors that you could write down. Right. Because it's in your ancestry on your computer. Right. Like my kids and my grandkids, they don't even care. And you know, right people now. people don't care until they get to a certain age, I think. And then they care. Hopefully they care. Yeah. They're supposed to care. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yes. Somebody gave it to the Nevada Historical Society and she wanted to research a relative that was hush-hush in her family. You never talked about yes. uncle, duh, yeah. whatever, whatever. And that was her goal, to find out why they never talked about Did she ever find out? Yes. Why was it? Why would they never talk about him? <laughs> okay, for the, for the video, for the video, for the people at home who are watching, this is a, yes, somebody was researching their family and um, had a, black sheep relative that they wanted to research and he apparently went to prison, but he never got hung. So that was the good part. Those are the, I had a friend in high school who was descended from royalty and a horse thief, I think. <laughs> she, she was as proud of the horse thief as she was of the royalty. Yeah. Well, thank you much for coming and thank you for caring about history. Yes, thank you very much, Karen. Uh, yeah, she can't walk away. <laughs> um, and thank you all for coming. Um, and I'm going to continue uh, every month this year, Francis Humphrey Lecture Series. Um, next month is going to be another female author, uh, Chris Entz, who writes about Western history in California and Nevada. Um, but I, her writing is a little more flashy. And, you know, you know, she, she wrote an article about um, Hannah Clapp that I read recently, and, and it just made Hannah Clapp seem more, more fun, you know? <laughs> you know, as opposed to reading the newspaper article or whatever. Anyway, so she'll be a fun uh, lecturer, uh, and we'll also be ha selling books. And then, of course, um, here at the museum, uh, you can buy Karen's books, and she can sign them for you. Um, and I'll put up the registration for next month's lecture tomorrow. Yay.